Welcome to the Art of Adventure. This is episode 191 with Jeff Shapiro. The Art of Adventure is the podcast that helps you travel the world, run your business, and embark on an epic quest. I'm your host, lead explorer and guide, Derek Laudermilk. Please head over to DerekLaudermilk.com to check out the show notes for this episode and all the other episodes. And you can download your free guide to the top 10 ways to make money while traveling the world. And real quick, before we start this episode, I want to mention our upcoming adventure quest. It's in Bali, April 22nd to 29. This is specifically for established entrepreneurs to help you build courage, be influential, to take action. It's a highly curated small group of other high-level thought leaders, we have four spots available left. It's going to be super awesome. We've got an amazing villa. We've got canyoning planned. We've got the trip to a volcano, the the one that's not erupting, (laughs) planned. So definitely, if that sounds like something for you, uh, check out AdventureQuest on DerekLaudermilk.com and let's have a conversation about it. Now, today's episode is an interview with Jeff Shapiro. And Jeff was suggested by a previous guest, Scott McKay. And he said, I think Jeff would be really awesome for you to have on your show. Obviously, he already admired Jeff. And uh, when I reached out to Jeff, he was super keen to come on the show. And we've never had anyone quite like Jeff on the show before. He is a wingsuit base jumper, a paraglider, a rock climber, a falconer, a professional sponsored athlete, and really a philosopher, which is, I think, probably the most important part for this conversation because it's it's a really unique episode and Jeff's in a unique position to talk about things where he encounters risk and death frequently. And so we have a, a real conversation about how he deals with experiences in a sport where his peers and friends sometimes don't make it and how he mitigates that risk for himself, how he makes a decision whether or not he's going to jump off a cliff and and how he deals with fear and how he earns his privilege to to be this pro athlete, to be someone that that does very cool, very unique experiences. Basically, he's one of the few people that that flies, and not like a pilot, but flies himself around <laughs> in air, which most humans don't naturally get to do. So super cool experiences that Jeff has. And then another important part that we talk about is how he translates this super cool life that he leads into something that's valuable for other people. It's not just that he's out there having fun all by himself. It's that he is bringing this experience back to inspire people. And and then what's the business model there? How does being a cool athlete help other businesses grow? And how does he get sponsorship and earn an income based on these extreme sports that he's doing? So very cool inside look, in-depth conversation with Jeff. Without further ado, Jeff Shapiro. <music> Welcome back to the Art of Adventure, and I'm here today with Jeff Shapiro. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And Jeff, I have to tell you that I it was I'm very excited for this interview. I feel like a little kid almost because mm-hmm. you know you're just cool, basically. <laughs> <laughs> You do cool stuff, and we had a conversation before, and it was a really fun, interesting conversation, and you're someone that I would love to continue learning from, and so this is like, this is a very, it's an opportunity for me to really enjoy this interview and conversation, but I just wanted to put it out there because because I do feel more excitement and maybe a little nerves than usual, and so, so I wanted to start off by asking, who are you? What does your own self 
perspective. Like, do you feel as cool as I think you are? <laughs> uh, wow. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'll tell you the thing that I feel most strong about uh, in my life these days is just being uh, aware of what I have and how lucky I am. I don't know if I could even define <laughs> if I could even define what cool is. I, I should get you to talk to my wife. That would be great. She <laughs> maybe maybe you could convince her. No, no. I honestly, I, I think that you know we have time on the planet, and I had some sort of plan or some sort of. Uh, idea as to how I was going to spend that time, and I, and I think it's my story is probably similar to to most people's story in in the way that the things that I, I was really fortunate to be born into a life that has allowed me the opportunity to 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 chase my passions. Meaning, I have I have had you know my parents who were very supportive. They were very adamant about teaching me how to work hard for what I want and to to care a lot about other people and that you know the the great one of the greatest lessons was that happiness is is the most important thing and you know more important than ambition more important than success and in fact i have lots of memories when i was a kiddo of my both my parents saying you know whatever you want to be you can be you know if you put your mind to it you can do anything with your life but it requires work and um, oftentimes hard work and dedication and discipline. And with all of those things equal, it doesn't matter whether you're washing dishes or you're a doctor. If you're happy, you're successful. And that's the most important thing. And I think that for me, that's kind of been the driving sort of direction in my life. And not, and you know, what I've said before was true. It wasn't intentional. It was just sort of a perspective that was driven into me. So when I was younger, you know, the ego and ambition of a young male drove me towards doing some of the things that I'm extremely passionate about now. Um, it wasn't just those things. It was a curiosity and it was a fascination and, and it was a, a desire to want to find out uh, what was out there and what was in me. Through those lessons, ironically, you know, what was originally driven by sort of ego and ambition has turned into a recognition that those things are actually pretty trivial and that the most important things for me is about living in the present. The discovery that no matter what it, what you're into, whatever calls to you, if you are present in those moments and appreciate those moments and try and utilize you know, the time, then the lessons will be learned. And there, you, you know, you can only be you, like I can only be me. So I, I learn at whatever rate I'm going to learn, I can want to be better at something, or I can want to, you know, have achieved something. But in, in other words, I could want the wind to blow, but it's only going to blow as it does. And, um, and I think that that has developed over time through lessons learned. And that whole Buddhist principle of, you know, trying to see the world as it is and not how I want it to be. That's kind of been, you know, a, a driving factor as of late. And I mean, you know, who am I? I you know, I, I would hope to think that that is a still a developing thing. You know, who I am now is very different than who I was when I was, uh, you know, a young guy and, and um, certainly will be different than I, I will be if I make it to an old guy. So, you know, one day at a time and yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but so take me through, if you would, the experience of doing a wingsuit base jump, and in during that experience, maybe you could maybe you could highlight like what happiness maybe happens in reflection of the experience, or or happens like at each moment that you're present during experience, but. But maybe you could just like sort of like walk us through what it's like to do one of those jumps and then and then help me see like where happiness comes in with doing something sure. like that. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd always been fascinated with flight, uh for one reason or another. And I, I think, you know, I've I've thought about this quite a bit. I think I think that flying represents a level of freedom that is um feels unattainable for for people. And you know, to me, and this certainly isn't to take away from anyone else's passion or experience, but being in an airplane feels like a, like being in a car. It's like a, you know, it's a, so 
the the way I dreamed of flying was was you know as I saw it actually flying you know flying like a bird. I think that I've always sort of been fascinated by that and and wanted to chase that experience. And like I said before, what ends up happening is the result of that is is that the essence of the activity, similar to surfing or any other thing that people are into is to be in the present, to live in the moment. And wingsuit base jumping is one of those activities that for me, whew, you can't do it and not be in the moment. I mean, literally, my brain can't compute fast enough to include anything other than the moment when I'm doing that activity. And that's a really, really, really special place to be. It's not to, to make everything else go away. It's to sort of get into this place where you can't predict what is going to happen you can think what you know you can sort of expect and and hope to expect but the reality is is once you jump off the cliff there's no such thing as breaks and you can only react to what's in front of you and i liken it to surfing because similar when you catch a wave you know you can expect to pop up and you can expect to trim out and you can expect to be on a wave but you can't ever have realistic expectations as to what the experience will be like because you're only reacting to the wave that's in front of you as it comes. So as a result, when you kick off that wave and you paddle back out into the lineup, it's not the wave that you're trying to recreate. It's the feeling. And a wingsuit base jump for me is that there, you know, people ask me all the time, how long does it last? Most of the time I have no idea. Honestly, the, the, uh, the amount of time, whether it's 20 seconds or two minutes, it's just completely irrelevant. And the reason is, is because time being relative does, just doesn't matter. It's just such an intense experience and, and such a, a free feeling that you're living every second as an entire lifetime. So for me, I also had just have a deep seated love for the mountains. Often wingsuit base jumps these days for me are a solo hike in the mountains just from the beginning, walking through it. When I wake up at my home and my wife and kiddo are asleep and I'm drinking coffee, grabbing my rig and my wingsuit and heading out the door while it's still dark out. It's a, a really satisfying feeling to know that you're you know, one way or another, I'm going to have a, a memorable experience, and whether I walk down or jump or not. And that that uh, in itself is already pretty special. And drive into the mountains, hike up for hours, watch the sun crack the horizon, usually over, you know, another mountain range. You know, those those moments alone where you can think and get into the the now and to really appreciate where you're at and what you have, that sort of prepares me for the jump and, and to be able to gather the most from it. And, you know, I get to the exit and, and during that whole hike, I'm sort of going through all of this process, you know, the process that everybody feels, how I deal with fear, how I deal with doubt, how I deal with, you know, the linear and intuitive thoughts that are required to decide whether or not the jump is appropriate for me. I'm looking at the conditions, I'm looking at birds, I'm looking at the wind in the trees, I'm looking down, hopefully, if I can see it at the bottom and trying to sort of go through that process so that when I get to the exit, that decision whether or not to jump is made. And on the mornings that I'm lucky enough where everything seems to feel right and fit, it's quiet. I'm up on the, the you know, this, this perch on the top of a big wall in the mountains, totally by myself, nobody around you know, taking the wingsuit out and going through that, you know, sort of mantra of checking my gear and, and doing what I need to ensure that I've done all the steps that I've earned the right to make the jump and that I feel like it's an appropriate decision to make. And after I'm all suited up, it's hard to describe. I usually take some deep breaths and look out at the horizon and look around and appreciate where I'm at when the timing feels right. You know, the decision has already been made, so there's no reason to wait around. There's no reason to be nervous. There's no reason to be scared. Yeah, when you push off, you know, I've flown other things, hang gliders, paragliders. Flying a wingsuit's really special because, yes, there's speed, but it's not this intense. I mean, it is intense, but it's not this adrenaline rush that everybody thinks that it is. The second I jump off the cliff, I feel, I know that, first of all, I know the wingsuit's going to work. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be jumping. So that trust allows me to enter this experience with, you know, with a confidence that allows me to relax. So 
you know, as soon as the suit starts flying or I start flying the suit and start to separate from the, the cliff a little bit. And in a wingsuit, airspeed equals potential for lift and the ability to control the suit. So it's usually about between two and three seconds before you, I feel the suit powered up enough to be able to control it. And those, you know, that the exit, the, the actual jump, that part of it is pretty important because you are exposing surface area to the conditions without enough airspeed to control the suit fully. So you have to do that part right. And I'm very focused, obviously, during that part. But once I start flying, I just feel completely free and free of time, free of, of any other thought. And, you know, you're flying. You're flying with your arms. You know, you, you know, you're not flying in something. You're flying. I was fascinated with with that feeling from dreams as a kid. And, and a wingsuit, uh, more than probably any other type of flying, allows me to fly like those dreams, you know, like where, you, where you, you know, yeah. you're, you're flying. <laughs> <laughs> and and then and then uh, you know the the moment that I decide to deploy my parachute, that kind of cracks me back into reality. It's funny I go from a, almost a, a, a one state of consciousness to another, and because I've flown so many other things um, similar paragliders and hang gliders, as soon as I'm under a clean canopy, I feel sort of at home and relaxed and and more in my like a normal conscious mind, the mind that I'm in now you know, you're still on the sharp end and you still have to pilot your parachute to the ground safely. And in Montana, that can be, that can be pretty sporty. The places that I land don't allow a whole lot of room for error. But once you're on the ground or once I'm on the ground, it's a, such a strange feeling. I have so many memories of this happening where the, the canopy is made of a very lightweight material. And that material you know, there's usually not a whole lot of wind on the ground. So when you, when I land, the canopy will slowly drape into the sticks and drop and everything is quiet. And I'm standing there sort of, you know, in, uh, just amazed in awe of what I just was able to experience. And it's not feeling of accomplishment or a feeling of, you know, it's not that feeling where you want to stand up and run around and throw your fists in the air. It's, <laughs> it's more like a, I feel like I'm, I'm uh, just a small part of something much bigger and that that I'm very, very, very fortunate to live the life that I do. And that, you know, and I've said this before in, in, in another interview that no matter what the outcome of that jump was for me as an individual, life would not change. It would stay the same. And that for one reason or another, that separation from self, you know, meaning when I get to view the world as it is and not how I want it to be. That ends up driving my my perspective towards towards one of empathy and the, the ability to pay closer attention and to appreciate my time every second of my time with with the people that I love and, and to decipher between what is important and what really isn't important. And for me, that's it's kind of fleeting. And I would assume that for most people it is. It's it's one of those things where it's really easy in the routine of life to get caught up in being upset about something or concerned about something or stressed about something. And I think um, oftentimes for me, those things end up not being worth that energy. And, and it's, it's usually moments like after a wingsuit base jump that I recognize that in the clearest way. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, the, <laughs> to describe the feeling of packing my parachute up, it's like, you know, I, I just, um, got to do this thing and, you know, no cameras and no people. And I am walking out by myself. And I think that there's a pureness in doing something that affects me that profoundly and having nobody see it and nobody care, you know, and I just, I, I just, I just really feel grateful for that and walking out and picking, you know, picking berries and and everything tastes sweeter. Everything smells better. Everything, uh, I feel the, the wind on my face and appreciate the fact that I can use my legs and all these things that just aren't thoughts that go through my head on a regular basis. And that not to, you know, sort of be overly dramatic about it, but it's a, it's pretty, it's a pretty profound thing. And then of course I get back to the car and I drive home and the whole thing is, is done by 10:30 in the morning and I'm, you know, able to work and, and go on with my day and I pick my daughter up from school and it's not the same. I'm, I wasn't, I'm not the same as, as I was the day before. And it's like that every single time. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, really grateful for it. 
That sounds so amazingly powerful, and and you do it repeatedly, which is you do it you do it regularly. Yeah, yeah. I used to I used to uh, do it three to five times a week uh, by myself at least here in the mountains, and then go on trips and and sometimes jump multiple times a day. And um, and I'm not saying that it's it's um, better or worse with friends. I think it's an amazing experience to share with someone else. It's you know it, it might be different, but it's no it's no uh, it's no better or worse. It's just it's just amazing either way uh, to be able to to have that opportunity to do it. But but I, I do want to stress too now you know sometimes priorities change and I I think that the key for me is to do whatever I'm psyched on. So whatever inspires me in the morning and and I think that anybody listening to this would identify. We all are looking for. I feel like I, I'm looking for purpose. You know, it's like everybody wants to have a purpose when they wake up. You yes. want to find find the thing that drives you, that makes you, that inspires you. You know, for me, it, it, whatever inspires me. That's what I live for. And it's a balance of things, right? It's some some things are self-serving. Some things are to help other people. Some things are to try and learn more or and and I think that that inspiration for me is is one that applies for, to everybody because it doesn't really matter what it is that inspires you. It could be work, it could be your kids, it could be, frisbee golf it could be whatever it is that makes you happy and i think that for me some, sometimes it's wingsuit base jumping and sometimes i do it often and um, sometimes it's not sometimes it's um flying a paraglider or sometimes it's quiet time with my family at home and i get the same my, my whole point in bringing that up is that sometimes i or you know often i get the same feelings that i just described in that wingsuit base jump in the moment that i sp- you know, that I, that I pick up Naya from school and we have a conversation about what happened to her that day. You know, it would seem trivial if I was somewhere else, but if I'm there, I get that same level of appreciation and that same level of, God, I can't believe how lucky I am to, to have this life. And so, yeah, I, I would say that I do oftentimes go and do these things on a regular basis. And I try and remind myself that feeling is fleeting. So I do try and remind myself, but it's not always that way, you know. I'll do it in other ways too, climbing in the mountains or or uh, sure. or quiet quiet time with my family. Yeah, I think what I was getting at by saying how you get to do it over and over again, I was thinking about how you know the experiences of the actual flight is only a few minutes, but you know your morning experience is several hours. But you know, say if you go for many weeks in between a wingsuit base jump, you still have that experience. But how how does the frequency contribute to your overall happiness if it if it does at all. I think you know what what we were talking about earlier is applicable to that question. I think it, I think it's true. I do think that it's easy. Um, we're we're human beings. So we you know I, I make mistakes and fall into the pitfalls that everybody does. And I think that it's really easy when you get into a routine. For me, it's really easy to start to feel less connected to that idea, to that gratitude. And I think that for me, it's important to consistently remind myself through, you know, the things that I love to do most. What I think is a really uh, important fact for me is, is that when I'm doing things that I love to do, no matter what it is, I'm a happier person. It, it's easier to make that choice to be happy. And if I'm happy, then I'm able as an individual, then I'm able to give the best of myself to the to the people that I love. So when my wife is comes home, she she feels that I'm happy, you know, and that I think is a collective thing. I think the the more we sort of surround ourselves with happy people, the the more balanced and, and even we all feel and, and it, that is contagious and it spreads. And, and so you know, if, if you think about it, if you simplify it to two choices, you know, to live your life in a way that uh, you choose to be happy or or the opposite of that, why would you make the opposite choice? I mean, it doesn't seem to me like that that would be a, a, a strong life move, you know. So, you know, a lot of this that we're talking about is really intuitive. It's really something that you feel. And and yet, on the other side of it, if you look at it, it's also quite logical. You know, we all want to be happy. We all want to be inspired. At least I do to do anything other than things that fulfill you and that cause you to continue to learn. 
I, I think that that would be way for me, that would be wasting my time here. Yeah. You know, I think you brought up a good point about how happiness affects other people and how having happy people around you. I think the, the research says that happiness goes two or three connections away, like, um, you know, six degrees of sep- separation. Sure. I think happiness can influence like your friends, friends, friends. So it's almost an imperative to be happy because your your ripple effect is <laughs> is affecting the happiness of thousands of people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's where empathy comes from. We are small parts of a bigger thing, which which essentially means we're all connected. And as cliche as that sounds, it's it's super true. I mean, why do you walk into a room and instantly like someone, or you can instantly tell that someone is upset about something? It's something that we recognize because it's in within within each of us. And I think that if I can be happy, I mean, you know, the, the things that I think we've all asked ourselves, like, what, what am I doing here? Like, what, what exactly am I doing? Am I just sort of living my life and, and it's going to begin and it'll end and, and that's it? Well, I mean, to me, it seems like the answer to that question is the only thing that I can do in this life is to to continue to learn, experience as much as I can, and to pass on as the, the greatest level of positivity to the people that I interact with. And if during that lifetime, I can have even a little bit of positive influence on someone's life in, in a way that affects them, or, you know, promotes a, a discovery on their path, then I'm psyched. I mean, I feel like I'm doing my job, you know, and uh, I'm going to have one no matter what. I always, you know, I think that like, I feel like that part of it is up to me. But if I can share that and, you know, obviously I can't share the emotion of something with someone else, you know, that's an undeniable fact. I can't tell someone what it's like to wingsuit base jump. You can only find that out for yourself. And the emotional response, you know, you might be able to catch a glimpse of it, but it's not something that I can give to somebody but, or, or get from someone, you know, but, but the way I can share those experiences and how they affect me is exactly that, how that experience has changed me as a person can be shared through your general and everyday interaction with people, just based on the way you uh, care about other people and care about life and carry yourself without strings attached, try and give of yourself to the people around you in a way that that describes that that appreciation and, and empathy. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I I think it's a I think it's a huge gift. You know, if you if you can if you can figure that out, I I, I s- sort of feel that as an as an immense gift from the people that influence me in a positive way. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Can you take me through the? You talked in the when you're explaining your your morning walk to the exit i believe you call is that the, the point where you jump yeah. the exit? Yeah, so yeah. i'd love to hear about decision making and so you're you're relying on observations of the birds and the wind and the weather and your own experiences and maybe a checklist with something that is potentially life-threatening decision making and i think risk management is what you called it is is super important but how do you how do you feel confident that you have made the right decision to jump or not to? You know, a friend of mine once said that if you uh, it, you know you have to you have to earn it. So you know, when I've said before in the past that you know if if someone's doing it, you can do it. Like you know, if it's possible, even if you just dream it up, it's possible. But that doesn't. I guess I took it for granted when I said that, um, that people would understand or know that what I meant was, and I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll make the point now, um, that that doesn't mean that it doesn't require a lot of work. You have to do the work, you know, you have to take the steps and those steps have to be small when risk management is, means, means the difference between life and death. I, I feel like if you've gotten to that point and you've done it properly, then you've, You've earned it through the experiences necessary to make those decisions in an appropriate way. Sometimes when we're learning things, we don't know what we don't know. So occasionally you can find yourself thinking that you're making a good decision and and not. And in wingsuit base jump, you can't find that line. You know, when we when we ski or surf or 
you know, kayak or whatever, you, you know, you can find that line and sometimes you can push that line a little bit and, um, and pushing up against it means maybe, uh, having a scary moment or getting, getting hurt. But in a wingsuit jump, if you find that line and you push beyond it, it usually means loss of life. So it's an unacceptable line. And, um, I think that the key to not finding that line in that in that art form is to just be okay with making decisions on the conservative side and take the smallest steps possible. A good friend of mine always says, you know, and it's a common term in base jumping, slower is faster. So how do I make a decision base jump specifically? Uh, you know, I try and gather all of the facts including how I feel, you know, like uh, my mental and physical state, go through the exercise of whether all of those pieces uh, match up to uh, feeling okay about that decision. And, and once that decision's made, I'm, I'm okay with it. And whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I don't mean that I'm throwing caution to the wind or that I'm hoping for the best because that's not what's happening. I'm trying to make a very educated decision. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a father, you know, I, I, I want to come home uh, each evening and that's um, that's really important to me, especially having dealt with and seen the aftermath of when it does go wrong. You know, for I, I do this because I love life. You know, I'm not trying to cheat death or or you know do it for any other reason than because I absolutely love living and want to live my life in a way that is true to my story. You know, and so yeah, that's what I do. I just I gather all the information through the years of experience try to make my decision as educated as possible. And at the end, the only time I jump is when that, that information leads to yes, you know, and, um, and then, you know, I mean, life is life and what is going to happen is going to happen. And so I do everything I can to be trained and to be educated and to gain the skill set necessary to uh, have that decision lead to a, an outcome that allows me to come home. You know, I, does, that, does that answer your question, I guess? Yeah, I'm curious about, I guess, some of, the, some of the specific skills. Or What I'm imagining is that the first time you do a solo wingsuit base jump, it's still going to be way outside of your comfort zone, even if you've done simulators or even if you've flown paragliders or hang gliders before is there can you effectively pair, prepare for that first jump yeah i see what you're saying yeah you know uh not really <laughs> i mean yes you can you can you can skydive a lot and you can work yourself up to that point incrementally but but it's true i would be completely lying if i said that the first time i stood at the top of a cliff with a parachute on, even after jumping off of bridges, even after jumping off of, you know, out of airplanes, that I was prepared. And that activity in particular is unique because, you know, in climbing, you work your way up, right? You, you know, you do these things in small steps, but they're, it's all yes. similar. Whereas in a jump, you know, you're, com you're, you're basically committed a hundred percent when you jump. And Essentially, you have to deploy your parachute to save your life. So mentally, my and I'm bringing myself back to that first time that I jumped off of a cliff, and this is without a wingsuit. Mentally, or physically, I'm thinking, no, 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 mentally, I'm thinking that, hey, I'm trained. I've made the decision. The conditions are appropriate. I know that my gear works. I've triple checked it. Uh, I know the landing zone. I know the approach that I'm going to use. I know the conditions down there. I know the conditions up here. All of these things are going through my mind, and I feel okay about the decision. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing three feet from the edge of the cliff wearing the parachute. But my my body, my you know, physically, your brain is saying, "Do not <laughs> jump off this cliff. Like, why would you do that? Don't do that. That just means death, right?" And I think that that is a just a genetic you know, consequence of, of being pretty fragile over the eons as humans have developed. And that I think is a cool, it's kind of cool to talk about in itself because when you do, when you do to make the decision to, to jump and you have this experience, I think what I was doing was essentially telling myself that what I thought was impossible was actually possible. And that carries over to other things in life. And that's really an interesting facet of it. 
if you know, in other words, if you can do that, well, you know, well, you can do anything. You know, why couldn't you dream up a, a massive adventure and make it happen? I also think that that what I defined before as a result, you know, being that that you discover what's important and what's trivial. I think that that part of it is really important too, because when you have that level of gen, you know, like genetic fear, and you do it anyways based on your training. And then you successfully complete the task. I think that discovering that what's important and what's trivial takes on a completely different level of meaning. I can very easily open my mouth and say, you know, you know, family's important and traffic is trivial. But when you when you feel it, that can come, I think, in a, it, you know, it comes for me, it comes in a different form when for one reason or another, I've sort of discovered the, 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 like the baselines in life. And I think mortality is one of them, you know? So I, I did want to, want to talk to you about mortality and I have, I have some experience, you know, cycling, bike racing has always a risk of death. Even when you leave to go for a ride in a city, there's cars everywhere. And it's, um, the, it's a very, let's call it a fragile position like mm-hmm. if you if you break then then you break it's not super resilient and you know the line that we're talking about in base jumping or or flying it's not like in skiing or surfing where you can crash and get injured and, and be okay so i i'm i'm assuming that you are at peace with your own mortality in in some sense but could you talk about your your own relation to to that for yourself like how, how do you feel about you know knowing that you you will die at some point but you're doing activities that, you know, are, put you in a, in a very fragile, fragile place. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a tough balance because that fragility is what drives us to dr- drives me to, to want to do it in a, in a strange sense. Um, it, because it does. It points out how, lu- how lucky I am to be alive and to um, it allows me to appreciate my life uh, in a really profound way. But you're absolutely right through the act of and, and you know, look. To quote my dad, none of us are getting out of this alive. Like everybody's <laughs> got to do it, right? We got to do it. And I think that you know, fear of that ends up causing a lot of a lot of issues. I think it causes us to not have the confidence to chase our bliss sometimes when there's perceived risk. And I think that understanding the difference between justified and unjustified fear, and and uh, how to deal with that risk is it's a it's like anything else you have to train it's a skill you know and you have to expose yourself to it and you have to practice the art before you're going to ever be good at it and it's no different than any other skill um that's not easy to do because th- the only way to practice that skill is to expose yourself to risk and to do that you're you know opening your opening yourself up to um to injury or, or possibly getting getting the chop you know and I, I think that that's why it's so hard to get good at that skill, to the skill of, of losing your fear of, of, of dying, essentially, is, is really, really challenging to gain um, because it's so hard to practice and practice with a, with a you know, with, over a long period of time. And I mean, that's, it sounds really, lo- you know, really obvious, but, but, but that's, that's how I see it. I, I think it's difficult. It's a, it's a skill that's hard, to, it's hard earned. And then over the years of practicing, as you know, you probably experienced as well, we surround ourselves with people who are living those similar lifestyles and interested in the same things. And over the years, uh, during the practice, which is why it's so hard to gain that skill, people lose the game, you know, people die. And when someone dies doing the thing that you're doing, it causes a level of self-reflection that is hard to find in other, in other facets of life. So in other words, if I'm doing a base jump or I'm going climbing in the Himalayas or I'm flying a hang glider in a competition in Europe or I'm, you know, whatever it may be. And during those moments uh, that I'm chasing my bliss, a a good friend, um, someone that that I identify with and that's very similar to me in terms of mindset experience, maybe even greater levels of experience and skill gets killed. It's hard not to look in the mirror and to just ask yourself, is this, is it worth it? You know, because, because I love living, am I really, am I really willing to have it all end simply for one more experience? And, and when you've experienced something, how many times do you have to experience the same thing 
until the lessons that you're learning aren't worth the risk anymore. And that's just such a personal question, you know. Um, and it changes. It's dynamic, too. It changes through life. Uh, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's not. I've kind of come to the place in my own life, and that's, you know, the only person I can speak for is myself. And that's that, as an example, and I've said it before, you know, jumping, uh, one jump is never worth it. But jumping is worth it. And what that means is that if I'm climbing a route and a storm is coming in and I'm exposed in a way that makes the term self-reliance more meaningful than, than, you know, any other time, I need to make sure that I make a decision that allows me to come, to come back to the mountains and climb again. In other words, being there in the first place wasn't the mistake. The mistake would be to make a decision that would uh, not recognize the danger and to not do the thing that I needed to do to ensure my survival, um, not just for my own sake, but for the sake of everybody who loves and cares about me. And that just comes from um, perspective. And I think that that perspective, just like risk management, is is earned. And um, so that's where I'm at with it now is, you know, uh, yeah, I, I have to die just like everybody else. Uh, do I want it to happen? No, not really. Just like everybody else. You know, I love living. Am I afraid of it? Uh, you know, I think it's the last great adventure. When I, I, you know, what happens after we die? I have no idea. And I'll learn when I get there. That's uh, I don't want I don't want to know beforehand that where's the adventure in that, you know, but am I done here? No, no, no way. And do I find a high level of importance of being there for my kiddo and for my partner and for my parents and for my brother and all my friends? Absolutely. And will I make my decisions accordingly? For sure. You know, I think a lot of people uh, sort of misinterpret my willingness to do an activity that involves a very high level of risk as maybe um, having a little bit of a lack of, you know, sort of responsibility as a parent or a partner or friend or a son or a brother. And, and I, I don't agree with that. I think that I have to live my life. I have to continue to grow as a person and, and I have to do things the way that allows me to live my best life as long as I'm responsible with my life and responsible means making good decisions and training constantly and, and not putting myself in a situation that's irresponsible, uh, being that, that I'm doing something that I, that I haven't earned the right to do. And I, to me, that's really, an, that's really an important factor that I don't think a lot of people think about, you know, they see somebody jump off a cliff and they say, Oh, that guy's a nut nutter, you know? And the reality is, is that that person who's jumping off the cliff has spent, you know, most likely years of their life earning the right to be there by taking the small steps necessary to be there with a sense of confidence and hopefully founded confidence. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so when someone gets in an accident and they lose their life, they may be, you know, more or less experienced than you, but presumably they have some similar perspective about the risk that they're putting themselves in. And would you say that it's that it's largely just unforeseen natural circumstances that lead to an inaccurate assessment of the risk? Or what what can you learn for your own longevity through looking at why people perish? I mean this might be a, a statement that others would dispute, but I would say almost 100% of the time it's human error, you know? And, and that in itself tells me one of the most important lessons that I could learn if I'm doing activities that involve that level of risk is that I'm a human being and we're all fallible. We all make mistakes. I don't even know what the word perfect means, you know? Secure and perfect, those are just like made up terms. <laughs> and and I, I think that part of my decision making, part of that process also involves that, the recognition that I can make a mistake and I could feel completely confident doing what I'm doing and still make a mistake. So, you know, what's interesting is I've heard a lot of people say, like when they, you know, here, here's a good example. I, I paddle, a, you know, some whitewater for the first time. And because I'm nervous, because I'm uh, a little bit scared, I'm extremely focused, so I paddle the run clean. But on the fifth or the sixth time down that same run, I get flipped over in a high consequence area and and take a shot, you know, take take a rock to the helmet or something, and it widens my eyes a little bit as to where I'm at. 
why did it happen the fifth time and not the first time? And I think that some of that comes from, um, it's not complacency, but it's being a little too relaxed. I think that focus is, is, a, is a prerequisite for anything risky. And I think that that focus uh, is most heightened when there's a little bit of fear and a little bit of uh, you know, recognition of the seriousness of the position. And so when I see people, when I've been a part of fatalities or close to it in one form or another, it's not that that person necessarily just made a mistake as much as, you know, potentially the fact that human error exists, you know, maybe was something that wasn't focused on because of the level of currency or because of just the level of comfort involved in in what they're really good at. And, and you know, it's not always the case. Sometimes it's beginner mistakes. Sometimes it's, you know, like I said before, what we, you know, we find out that we don't even know what we don't know. Uh, but I think that oftentimes it's that. And, uh, you know, I just through those through those experiences, losing friends and seeing some fatalities happen, I try and recognize that when I'm doing something that is of consequences that that I should be a little f- afraid. I should be on my game. I should be focused and uh, that where I'm at and what I'm doing is serious. And and that hopefully allows me to, you know, paddle the run clean the first time and then decipher whether or not it's worth the, the lessons learned were, are, are worth repeating it. You know, I'm just imagining a night or someone in the old in the old days that went through a lot of battles and there's always like this old general who is like done every battle and he's still going and he's tough as nails and then there's like young young guys that super excited and they get run through with a spear in their first battle I'm, I'm just imagining you know and so a certain number of people are going to like the ones that have their wits about them they'll grow grow old and won't get killed on the battlefield and my assessment or it feels like you have the approach of uh managing all these risky activities like you're someone that plans to be an old general like to make it through i hope so i've (laughs) talked about it with friends uh that we were going to accomplish that and those guys aren't with us anymore so i hope that that's true i'm really trying as hard as i can and i think that the recognition it you know here's the thing is that's what i that's what i want to happen that's what i'm i'm shooting for you know i want to be an old guy i want to you know, I'm a I'm a falconer and I, I, I see myself, I have visions of myself as an old guy walking through the fields with a dog and a falcon on the fist until I'm, you know, barely able to walk, you know, flying in one form or another until I'm an old guy. I see I have those those aspirations. But I also hope that what will help me get there is the recognition that it can happen to me, you know? Better better guys have gone in. And so I think that if you're gonna play these games and the games are important enough to you and teach you enough about yourself and about life to be worth it, then it's important to recognize, once again, the seriousness of it and the idea that I am a human being. I am no better. I am fallible. I am fragile. And I have to be, I have to bring my A game and be on it. Otherwise, the decision to do the thing is irresponsible. And, you know, sometimes it is. And sometimes it isn't. Meaning like, Sometimes it's worth it and sometimes it isn't. I, I don't jump every time. Sometimes I walk down and sometimes it's not because the wind's blowing too hard or because because uh, whatever, because something doesn't check out. Sometimes it's just because I don't, I'm just not feeling it. You know, I go up there and for one reason or another, it's just something doesn't feel right. I'm just, I don't know what it is, but you know, so in relation to a wingsuit base jump or a base jump in general, I'm whenever I go, I go for a hike. I don't have any expectations of jumping. I only jump when I get there, when I, when I do the hike and I feel that everything is pointing towards yes, you know, that not only are the conditions good, but that it, it's also worth it, that I'm, I'm also going to get enough out of it as sort of sappy or cheesy as it sounds. Sometimes I just don't feel it and I'm not into it. So I walk down and I don't have anything to prove to anybody, even myself. So I think that if it's not for me, if it's not about gaining something that justifies that level of risk, then there's no reason to do it. And I just so soon go do something else, you know, go for a hike with my dogs or go for a trail run or, and those things have, have uh, the ability to teach me a lot about myself too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think it really, really appreciate you letting me take that there. That was 
and somewhat challenging emotionally and I imagine it could be for you so so thank you for, for being real sure I'd love to actually uh, so, I, so I posted on Facebook that I was going to be chatting with you yesterday and a few people said that they would love to hear about the the business model of your life and I I know you've said things like if you you know if you seek happiness if you do what you're passionate about you can't share the feeling but you can share the way it's changed you that's valuable for someone else and for sure. yeah. so right now you have your your brand ambassador and you're sponsored by a number of number of companies how how many how many partnerships do you have at the at the moment <laughs> uh, i don't be uh, i have to count i don't know um i i do i will say that i i involve myself with companies that uh, first and foremost, I believe in I believe in their products. I use them in one form or another, and they add to my ability to do the things that I enjoy doing most safely. I also uh, am involved with companies that the people that are involved in those companies are people that I believe in and feel like. For me to involve myself with a with a a company, it has to feel like a family and not like a business arrangement. And um, that's just a personal choice. That has nothing to do with the success or failure of, of anybody's relationship in a in the work environment. So there's no 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 judgment or anything. I'm just saying for me that's that was that's really important and uh, has led to some amazing relationships. You know the relationships that I have with the people that I work with are like family to me, and you know are it's all mutually supportive. So it's it's really it's really cool. And for me that it has to be that way. This was never this was never a goal for me. I was never. Never in my life have I said, I want to be a professional athlete, you know, like that was not on my radar. I uh, went to school, I went to school as a teenager, a late teenager after I got out of high school to learn and was interested in, in, in um, design. I, I got a degree in industrial design and made my living doing trade show and, and chaos, uh, kiosk, like trade show booths and kiosk design. We did some window design, 3D elements for window designs uh, in New York at the Macy's for mostly our, our largest clients were Nintendo and Toys R Us. So I, I basically made my living as an artist, just painting murals and sculpting. It was really an, an amazing time in life. And then slowly transitioned into designing and building indoor climbing gyms because of my passion for climbing. I had that opportunity and did some climbing gyms around the country. And then that sort of transitioned into commercial and residential construction as the work sort of slowed down and I needed to pay the bills. I remember coming back from a climbing trip in Alaska and, and recognizing that I I wasn't sure I wanted to bang nails my the rest of my life, you know. So I went back to school and I was always interested in high altitude medicine just from my uh, fascination with climbing in the greater ranges. And that led me on a completely different tangent in life. Um, and I went into healthcare and got a degree as a respiratory care practitioner and worked in an ICU um, and uh, at times in an ER for about eight years. And, um, and then during that time, I was started racing hang glider and uh, found enough, um, I guess, success in that, in that realm to, to start a relationship with the largest hang gliding manufacturer in the world. It's a company called Willswing in Southern California. And those guys, like I mentioned before, became like family to me. They were incredibly supportive and I tried to add what I could and that relationship felt very healthy. And, and it was supportive of me being able to use hang gliding as a vehicle to see the world and to discover sort of this, this alternate lifestyle, you know, to see a country for the first time by flying, by racing a hang glider for 100 miles over the mountains there was a unique opportunity that I didn't know existed. And then through uh, that venture, uh, I started to utilize, you know, everything comes full circle. It's like my, my, my old man told me that everything we do in life perfectly prepares us for what comes next. And whether we know it or not, right? And so for one reason or another, my design degree, industrial design degree and product design came back to uh, a useful point, and I uh, helped the guys at Willswing design a competition class hang gliding harness, and that turned into a pretty much a full-time monster. You know, I started building uh, custom harnesses for pilots all over the world, and it was it was so much work that between racing a hang glider and coming home and sinking needles for lots of hours, I didn't have time to be a respiratory you know practitioner anymore. So. Uh, respiratory therapy went out the window and that job had a lifespan and I'm really grateful for it, but it was over, you know, and I started to make my living building hang gliding harnesses and, and traveling around the world, 
race and hang gliders. And over time, those things started to build into other opportunities to seek adventure and to fulfill you know, my life in, in the way that, that I, I hoped that I could. And, and that involved climbing in the mountains and, you know, being a passionate climber. I've been climbing since I was 13 or 14 or something. Um, so, you know, a lot of my life has been devoted to that art. And, and luckily that led to some adventures that, that also involved uh, companies and gear. And, you know, all through all of these things, whether it's hang gliding, paragliding, climbing, you know, even base jumping and falconry, those things, I think there are, they, it became a realization that the companies that had the gear that I appreciated the most, they needed, you know, marketable imagery and sometimes feedback, or there were things that users could do to, to benefit their business, you know, whether it's imagery or storytelling um, or gear, you know, product feedback that relationship um, has to make sense. In other words, if a company um, can utilize the things that I do in a way that actually affects their market share, you know, I mean, these days of like, oh, you should be so lucky that I'm willing to wear your shoes. That, that's just bullshit, you know? Like you just, no, no one's that cool, you know? <laughs> and so what, what I think is really important for me at least is to try and contribute in a way that is, beneficial to that company in a tangible way that affects their market share. And if I can do that, then an investment makes sense and a, a business relationship can be formed. And if it doesn't, then no worries. Let's just be friends and have a beer at the end of the day, you know? And um, so for me, that's kind of, you know, you ask about the business model. I suppose, you know, being a guy that um, is fortunate enough to pay, you know, to keep keep the lights on through the things that I love doing most. It does involve a lot of work and that work involves trying to make sure that I honor my relationship with those companies in a way that benefits them and adds something to their business and allows for, you know, their products to to be showcased or to get to to improve, you know? I mean, is is that is that the question you were asking? Yes. Yeah, and I'm also curious about when you you are using some gear that you like and you and maybe you already know some people in the company and you're like, ah, oh, you know, it might make sense to do a partnership. And you start thinking about or you start discussing a potential relationship where you, they give you some gear or money or, or whatever, and you give them some feedback or photos. Or could you could you just talk a little bit about the process of figuring out what is what is a good value exchange? And, and do you um, approach them or do they approach you? And Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't. I try really hard to never seek out um, su support or sponsorship. It's got to feel mutually beneficial. It's got to feel right and clean. I think that for me has always happened just sort of, I mean, as, as strange as it sounds, it's always been sort of like a circumstantial or happenstance, you know, like a friend of a friend will introduce me to a company because they think that there's some mutually beneficial interaction that can happen or I ask about a particular product because I am curious or I you know buy a product and use it and just love it and it's better than anything I've ever used and end up contacting and thanking those people for making the product and showing interest in other products um, but either way I think that the value of that relationship is um, directly proportionate to the value that I bring and the value that it brings to my life, the, the gear typically. So in other words, if a company, you know, is, has a, has a super, super large target audience and their the amount of product that they sell worldwide is quite large. And what I do is beneficial in a way that affects that, then it's appropriate to, you know, have, have a relationship that reflects that, you know, I'm just as happy to, to trade, you know, my words and photos for, or time or whatever feedback for product alone, if it's supportive for what I do and none of it, I'm thankful for all of it, you know, and it has to feel right for everybody. So there are certain companies that I devote most of my time to because I, um, like I said, they're like family and I believe in what they're doing. And, um, I believe in, the message that they're sending, whether it be uh, lifestyle or conservation, or you know, most of the companies that I'm involved with, I try and make sure are socially and environmentally responsible companies. That that question is is sort of you know, it's 
it's case by case. It's really individual. And, uh, and as long as it feels good to everybody, I'm okay with it. I don't like to ask. And I think that like, like for instance, here's, here's a, here's something that I learned and I, it seems like it's a recipe, but it's not, it's just a, it's just an observation. People love to buy and they hate to be sold. So for when my interactions with people, I try and make sure that, you know, if I have a relationship, a business relationship with a company, that I'm something that they feel like is worth buying and I'm not trying to sell something to them. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm just curious. So, okay, maybe you can explain a little bit more actually. So, so what does that mean specifically? So what it means is that I don't want to, uh, my personal feelings about it is, is I don't want to convince someone that I'm a benefit to them. If I am, then I am. And, and we decide that there's some sort of symbiotic relationship that can be formed. In, in other words, I like your, your original question, do you go to them or do they come to you? I like to make sure that if I'm going to involve myself with a business, that, that I feel like we're doing each other a favor. You know, does that make sense? That, that I'm, not, I'm not asking them to help me and then willing to do something for it. You know, um, like Will Gad said in a podcast that I re- listened to recently, like I don't, I, I try and get uh, support to do things. I don't do things to get support. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I guess I'm asking for for anyone who's out there and they're doing something that they're passionate about mm-hmm. and they're they're improving and they're and they're getting to be at the top of their game and you know maybe they have a lot of photos and images of them doing interesting things or they they become a public figure. It's it seems like and I would probably advise like it's appropriate to think about, you know, brands that you like or who might who might benefit from the things you are doing and initiate conversations it doesn't seem like just living and doing the things you are passionate about are enough to for every potential good Definitely brand not. to 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 find you yeah i mean it's a job you have to do your job and you have to do it well and that means representing a brand image if you have to positively reflect on the brand image of a company to make uh, their investment into you, in, in you worth worth while and that can come in lots of forms. And you're right. I mean, you know, just doing or being good at what you do is not enough. You know, you, you have to try and pass on that, ins- that inspiration that you feel. And it has to hopefully affect that target audience in a way that inspires them not to do what you do, but to do their own thing, do what calls to them. That uh, says, I appreciate living life, not I appreciate living my life, you know. And, I mean, I do, but you know what I mean in terms of like representing or reflecting on the brand image of a company. And and I also think that being able to communicate effectively and in a positive way is an important skill set. And I think that, you know, I think once again, I think that uh, if you, um, it, it, everything's transparent, right? Like you have to be authentic about your love for what it is that you're doing and your reasons for what, why you do it. And And I think that as long as you're honest with yourself, and honest with the people that you're um, interacting with, that that part of it ends up becoming a positive. And then for me, what do I enjoy doing most? Well, let's just say climbing, for instance. I love climbing in the mountains, right? I love rock climbing. I love ice climbing. I love taking it all and putting it together and trying to have adventures in the greater ranges, trying to do first ascents, you know, in, in like places like the Himalaya. So when I go to the Himalayas, I need gear that's going to protect me from the elements there. I need to make sure that when I'm sitting in an exposed bivy at 21,000 feet, that I have a jacket that if I get a little damp, I'm, I'm, it's going to breathe and dry out overnight and that I'm going to stay warm and I'm not going to freeze to death. And I have boots on my feet that are going to allow me to keep all my toes and that the crampons and the tools that I use are the best tools that I can have on my, you know, in my hands and on my feet to get me through the technical ground, like we've been talking about, demands the understanding of consequence. You know, if I fall off and take a hundred footer uh, at twenty thousand feet on a remote peak in the Kishtwar, uh, like northern India, I, I'm on my own. Like there's no one I can depend on, but me and my partner, there is no rescue. There are no helicopters in the cashmere. There is no button I can push. It's just not France, you know? And so I need to have gear that functions the way that I want it to function. Right? So if I have two or three companies 
that are wanting to be involved with what I do, I'm going to choose the one that makes the best gear, the gear that I like the best. And that the people who are making that gear are people that I can interact with in a way that I feel like there's mutual appreciation. And that second part is just a personal thing. But the first part is an, it's like an essential piece of the puzzle. And so, you know, I chose a company to involve myself with that I wear the crampons and the tools that I, that I, that I, you know, the, from a company that I work with, because I know that they're the best out there. And, um, that's what I would buy. That's what I would choose. And when I tell somebody that I would choose that it's real and people believe it, you know, people don't believe brands, they believe people. And if you're just, you know, traveling around with patches all over your jacket, no one cares. No one believes that because you're just bought and paid for. But if you're, somebody who people understand wouldn't be climbing in crampons and tools that they didn't believe in a hundred percent, then they're going to think about that when they go and buy crampons and tools. And that I, I feel totally okay with that because it's true. It's authentic. It's, it's real, you know? And so anyways, that's how I try and represent the companies that I work for is just with complete and utter honesty, you know, absolute, uh, honesty about the lifestyle I choose to live and the gear that I choose to use when I'm doing the things that I love to do most. And for me, some of those things involve risking my life. And so the gear I choose is really <laughs> important. You know, it's really important. Do you have a mechanism for, like, say, so you've been working with a company for a year and you, you come back and you say, here's how I've affected your market share? Do you, how are you able to point to your no, there if they're good business people, they're paying attention. They have to be. Um, there is a traceability for social media outreach. There is a traceability for um, the projects that you do, how many people have been reached, and the exposure to that logo or brand image. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I think it's it's a discussion we all have as professionals. You know, you have to, you can't, you can't just like pretend. You know, so, you know, I mean, I think um, you got to be a doer for sure, but you also have to. Uh, be able to connect the things that you do with that company in a way that's positive for that company. And I think that that's sometimes it's it's a little bit foggy. It's a little blurry, but most times it's pretty traceable. You can tell. And, you know, I, I like I said, I don't I, I have discussions with with the companies that I work with in a way that's super positive. I don't negotiate. I don't say I deserve this or I deserve that or I did this and see this is worth that. I just don't do that. I would rather, you know, have great relationships with people and live in poverty than I would be to be rich for a season and, and be an asshole, you know? And I, and I, I just mean that in a way that like, I, I just think that, you know, I just feel so lucky to do what I do to claim that I deserve something for it is, uh, is not the kind of person I want to be, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. That's helpful for me and, and for other people that are looking to find the right partners. However, I, I however yeah. And I know, I know that makes it hard to say, Oh, well, God, you know, he's, you know, what he's saying is, it's basically just got to happen. And it's not that way. You, you do have to make some things happen and, and, um, and, you know, form your own reality. You know, you really need to, to believe and to do the things that, that you know, you can and do them with a, you know, with the, with the, with, with the right intent and with the um, intention that that's true and, and the rest will fall into place. But, but, you know, being proactive is not, it's not a bad thing. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, let things happen. You should be proactive if you, that's the lifestyle that you're interested in or, it, but what I am saying is, is that there's a certain you know, amount of let it happen that comes with being authentic and doing things for the right reason. If that makes sense, you, you can't, you can't go up to a company and say, you know, I think we should work together because I do this and I do that. I mean, you can, but you'd be the same as a thousand other guys that came before you and a thousand guys that are, are tapping on your shoulder and line behind you. I think that what's important is just to, just to follow your heart, do things, especially things that involve risk, do things because um, they're important to you, because they add to your life because they show you how beautiful life can be. And, and you know, if, if, if you want to involve your, uh, that life with work, then find the equipment that you uh, believe in, approach those people with gratitude, and, and see how you can get involved. And, um, and if you're doing things that 
benefit those companies, then that involvement can be beneficial to both people, to you and to them. And, and you know, I think just like an office job or a construction job or a restaurant job, it's important to learn the job and to get good at it and to be good at your job. Hopefully you'll have a, a satisfying work-related life, you know? Perfect. Jeff, I, I noticed we've been chatting for, uh, I've gone a little bit longer than even we intended. So I want to be mindful of your time. And so, so I've just got a couple more questions for you. Sure. Is there, is there anything that, that I haven't asked you about that you think is important for the listener to know? Um, no, I mean, I, you know, I mean, we, we've probably talked for for a number of hours about a lot of different subjects and uh, go in completely different directions. So, I mean, whatever your audience would be interested in, I'm happy to answer, but yeah, no, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I think that the, the things that we've talked about are, are pretty, you know, fundamental in, in terms of how I, I try and live a, a life that I'm proud of, you know? So my final question then will be if you could, change or add anything to the world what would you wish for the world to have um i mean you know this is gonna sound pretty pretty cliche but we, we, we're living in some dark times right now and i would be remiss to not mention that i would hope that people would understand that regardless of economic background or ethnicity regardless of where we come from where we live who our leaders are or what religious or political views we have, that we're all people. And that basic courtesy of treating other people the way that you would want to be treated is something that I would say I would wish for, for people to consider. I think that instead of dividing and to, um, you know, to, um, to react to fear, I think that we all just need to come together and um, understand that that choice that we've been talking about for the last 90 minutes about, you know, the choice to be happy is one that that we all can make simply by making that decision. And part of that is uh, understanding that the person next to you matters. They matter the same as, as your your family and, and uh, they matter the same as you. And um, and I guess that's what I would want. I would want, uh, you know, for the, the, you know, being the things that I love to do happen to be, uh, you know, in every corner of the planet. I go to places like, you know, Pakistan or wherever and meet the nicest people, like the most unbelievably kind of people. And I, I just, um, I'd like to see that spread uh, widely and, um, and for people to recognize that that we're we're all more alike than different, and and uh, you know, yeah, Ch- chase chase your bliss, not fear. You know, I think I think what you just said is is probably the most important is the focus on our similarity rather than our difference, because it's it's sort of about where you where you place your attention and how you choose to to view the same person focusing on how that person is different or how that person is the same as you. And it seems, it seems like also you're saying that your that exposure to people around the world helps you see those similarities. That's right. Yeah. Your intention speaks uh, in all of your actions. So if you, you know, I feel like if I feel connected to other people and I want the best for other people in the same way that I want the best for myself and my family, then that will reflect in everything I do. And hopefully even in the, the energy people feel from me when they meet me or whatever, you know, and if the more of us that, um, that can choose to be aware of, of that, uh, the, the better, the better the world will be. I mean, that, I mean, it's like I said, as cheesy or as cliche as that sounds, I just, I, I feel that that's a truth that's undeniable. I love it. I think it's a perfect place place to end and jeff i first i really really appreciate you having you on the show and i just want to acknowledge you for living your life in such a way that other people can have heightened experiences and it actually does i think inspire people including myself to 
go and be present in their lives and take risks and find and pursue their bliss and all these things. So, so I really uh, want to acknowledge you for living your life out loud in such a way and opening up doors for other people. It's, it's really powerful that you're, you're doing that. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity to, to talk, talk with you and, um, yeah, to, to essentially have a conversation with a bunch of of folks that I, I hope to meet someday, you know, it's great. It's like the oft occasion, actually it's not, it's not that often, but where I'll walk around and have somebody say, Hey, you know, I heard this or I saw this and thanks a lot or whatever. It leads to oftentimes to a conversation that allows me to gain a lot from, from them. And yeah, that's an, that's a, that's a gift to me. So yeah, thanks so much for allowing that and having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Jeff, where can people find you online? Um, you know, Cavu.com. Uh, Cavu is a clothing company in Seattle. They're a lifestyle clothing company. I've been with them for a lot of years. They're an, an amazing group of people. And more importantly, they're not just selling clothes, which are awesome, really, you know, loud and colorful and unique and grassroots. And I love their, their stuff. But also what, they, what they're selling is a perspective, you know. That perspective is shared by a, a number of people on their website. So if you go to kevu.com, they have a section for the athletes and you can find me there uh, along with some other really interesting characters. And, you know, on Facebook and Instagram, Jeffrey Shapiro, I think is my Instagram handle, I think. Uh, yeah, at Jeffrey Shapiro. And, uh, and then certainly Facebook. Um, if anybody has any questions or any comments or wants to just reach out, I'm usually pretty good about trying to answer anybody who reaches out. Um, I don't care who you are or where you're at. Everybody deserves respect, and uh, I try as hard as I can to answer everybody as, as, as quickly as possible. So uh, reach out to me on Messenger or on uh, in comments on Facebook or Instagram, and um, that's usually, honestly, probably the most reliable way to, to get me. Yeah, and that's uh, that's yeah. I just reached out to you, and and you responded, so I can vouch for the <laughs> your responsiveness. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I love connecting with people. Absolutely, it's the best best part about what I get to do is meeting new new amazing people. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Derek. I appreciate it. Bye bye. Wow, another amazing interview. I feel super privileged to have Jeff share with us such intricate details about how he lives his life. Very, very fascinating and rare individual. So if you got something from this episode, if you learned something about fear or decision making or about yourself and inspiration, we'd love for you to just let Jeff know on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, give him a shout out. Thank him for coming on the show. Tell him what you got from it. Show your appreciation. And if this show inspired you to want to be more adventurous, and hopefully all of our episodes do, but if this one did in particular, definitely think about coming on Adventure Quest. Uh, the next one is in Bali. It's in April 2018. This is specifically for entrepreneurs looking to take their business to the next level. So whether that's six figures or beyond up to seven figures, uh, we are going to help you break through your ceilings, whatever limits you're hitting, uh, financial, responsibility, leadership. We, we're going to help you have this, this courage, this ability to inspire people, to teach people how to think and be influential to get very clear on purpose and increase your productivity and just really clarify the vision for who you're going to be showing up as an entrepreneur going forward. It's going to be a very powerful, really fun retreat. We've got a lot of awesome activities planned in a great location. So I highly encourage you, if that sounds like something you're interested in, uh, head over to DerekLoudermilk.com, check out the the Bali trip page and let's have a conversation see if you might be a good fit for the group thank you so much for listening today now it's your turn to go out there and be adventurous